Thank you, Greg. Um, welcome, everybody. It's great to see um, people all around uh, the country um, wanting to see what we're up to over here in Western Australia. Um, so, yeah, as Greg mentioned, um, through a series of investments here in Western Australia, the uh, the government over the last um, 14 years has really, uh, I guess, responded to the desire of, of uh, pastoralists to be able to um, better manage their fodder and, and be able to um, respond to market demands and um, particularly both with live export and also new and emerging markets. Um, today I'd just like to sort of give you an overview of what's happening, uh, where it's happening, um, some of the reasons that people share with me as to why they're going through uh, these investments, um, some of the risks involved in that and some of the challenges in managing it, but also some of the opportunities that it presents. Um, firstly, in terms of um, those who aren't familiar with um, particularly the West Kimberley, um, this is a, an idea of roughly where these uh, developments are located. So on this very broad map you'll see some tiny little red dots and, and that's basically where um, our clients are. And as you can see in the far left corner there we have Port Hedland, which is uh, roughly about 630 kilometres south of Broome. And on the far right hand side um, you'll see Halls Creek and so and Fitzroy Crossing. So uh, that's roughly about uh, 600 kilometres in the other direction. So we have a very diverse range of clients um, and they're, as you can see, very very much spread out, which is a great challenge for us and them, uh, predominantly them. Um, so it's not unusual for me to, to travel, um, you know, a few thousand kilometres to go and see people on a monthly basis. Um, so we, um, probably the main point here, I guess, compared to most other agricultural systems is that they're clearly not centralised, which um, means that sharing information, sharing machinery, sharing knowledge is difficult. It's difficult for consultants, it's difficult for service providers, and it's and it's difficult for the pastoralists. Um, I should point out, whilst today I'm predominantly talking about pastoral irrigation, uh, we certainly do have some active horticulturalists in this area and they're very uh, successful businesses. There's not a lot of them, um, but they're part of the mix as well. Um, and I guess because of this arrangement that we have where, where our clients are quite diverse, uh, we term that mosaic agriculture, which um, has been bandied around uh, for some years. Um, and really, in our case, the mosaic is is not an option. It's the only choice. It's um, we need to focus on where people have the interest, where they happen to have access to land, where they have access to resources, and the will to invest. And that inevitably means that they are going to end up in this uh, very spread out state. Um, in terms of what people are doing, you know, uh, when I came to Kimberley in 2006, uh, there was just a tad over 500 hectares of irrigated land uh, in the West Kimberley. And today I did a quick head count. Yesterday um, between the Kimberley, West Kimberley and the Pilbara, uh, we're now touching sort of closer to 4,500 hectares. So that gives you some idea of the expansion over that time. Um, and these are some of the examples of, of where people are invested. So we have um, our horticulturalists, as I mentioned. Uh, we have some significant investment down in the Pilbara. Uh, undoubtedly our largest irrigation developments outside of the um, more established areas of Carnarvon and Kununurra. Uh And we have a number of smaller um, investments across pastoral stations uh, in those locations that I showed on the previous slide. Um, the kind of size that's involved, it can be as small as um, you know, 20, 25 hectares and, and it could be you know, close to 1,000 hectares. Um, there is, and people have different reasons for investing that, that I will explain uh, later on. Uh, the other thing to point out is that all of these investments have um, quite a significant lead time to fruition. So uh, when I first joined the department, um, we were looking for new opportunities and, and trying to um, understand exactly how much lead time was required and the amount of effort that goes into approving uh, 
uh, and meeting regulatory requirements for a project is significant in both in terms of time and money and that's quite a um, challenge and it's predominantly where we were helping people in the early phases. Uh, we've now shifted on to those uh, projects being approved and commencing and therefore our focus is shifting much more into the production system and farming system management. There's a few unique drivers with investment in WA that are different to the Territory in Queensland and um, and some of those things are, are driven by um, our landscape, some of them are driven by isolation and some of them are driven by our policies and, and particularly markets. So just to explain some of those, um, isolation really does change the economics of particularly a product like fodder. So something that's fairly bulky, it's um, not really high value, but it takes up a lot of space on a truck. Uh, is expensive to transport. So, you know, you could buy, um, 10 years ago, you could buy oat and hay from Perth and it, it might cost you somewhere around $180, $200 a tonne, but it's going to cost you $150 to get it to Broome. So, whilst the cost of the, the hay was comparable to other areas, its value was much higher landed here in Broome. And uh, I guess my initial conversations with people seeking to invest in uh, irrigation were could I grow my own hay more cheaply than what I can buy it and can I remove myself from the, um, the various market forces in the hay market so that I'm not at the mercy of good and bad seasons down south and, and good and bad seasons here in the Kimberley and that was really the initial thrust for a lot of people to invest. Um, coupled with that um, is our limited rainfall and so I was in the Territory a few weeks ago and um, you know relatively speaking they had a, a dry year but they still got a thousand millimetres of rain whereas many of our areas here um, are lucky well they wouldn't receive that on a normal wet season so we're dealing with rainfalls of less than 600 mils in most cases and the variability within that is very high so it's largely cyclonic or monsoonal driven rain so um, that presents great difficulties with um, particularly any kind of introduced non-irrigated pasture um, so I was looking around the Douglas Daly area there a few weeks ago and despite the wet season you know there's still very good cavalcade crops and very good dairy grass crops and uh, whilst they weren't quite what they would be on a good season, they were still, um, you know, very impressive. Um, so our natural pastures are very much limited and they've evolved to survive in those climates, but, um, you know, depending on the type of country that you have, um, some people have very good natural resources and, and really don't require um, improved or, or irrigated pastures. Others, uh, particularly if they're on a pin down landscape or our sandier soils, um, have very, very limited capacity to put on weight um, beyond mid-dry season. Um, another thing that's um, somewhat unique, uh, maybe not just to Western Australia, but it's certainly a feature of uh, Western Australian policy, is that the, um, uh, the policy position around uh, the use and introduction of non-Indigenous plants is quite um, careful, and it's careful for, for good reason. It's, it's, you know, we're looking about environmental protection and making sure that we don't introduce plants that um, are uncontrollable and go beyond have an offsite impact. Uh, however, we have a big challenge to balance that with the plants that are economically viable to grow in our landscape and in our climate. And um, not always, but certainly in uh, many cases, the kind of characteristics that make a plant desirable from a pastoralist point of view can often contribute to its weeding status. Now, that's not always the case. There's, there's other plants that um, uh, can tick both boxes, but it does tend to have our choices and um, so there's a quite a um, strong interest at the moment in that conversation about how do we get that balance right and how do we uh, balance opportunity and um, care for our environment. Um, probably the most significant change in over here has been the um, 
the market forces and so that's sort of really been in two places it's, it's sort of different markets opening up uh, like Vietnam and others and the uh, opening of the um, Uter abattoir so uh, Jack Burton who's the owner and manager of the abattoir was on ABC yesterday actually just saying that he just touched um, 1300 head a week uh, and was basically at capacity which um, has taken some time to build up. Um, that's probably driven by two things. We've had the, um, the dry year, as I mentioned before. Uh, however, we've also, what he's anticipating is that um, as the year goes on, that he'll have access to heavier cattle through some of the investments in irrigation. Um, and with the opening of other markets that are taking heavier cattle or breeder cattle, then um, that also presents an opportunity for pastoralists to try to retain more weight on the farm um, and hopefully you know, have a higher share of profit as a result. Um, however, it's not a cheap investment. So um, the, we just did quite a bit of work with CSIRO and um, others around, you know, we've, we've been working on these costs for quite a while. We, we were quite aware of the, the raft of costs that um, were involved. We sort of worked quite in, intimately with pastoralists on these before the uh, development even gets approved. But it's, um, when you really look at everything from, um, you know, the hydrogeology involved, the environmental clearances, the access to groundwater, uh, the infrastructure and the ground preparation, it's not uh, uncommon for that to tip past uh, $12,000 a hectare if it's uh, based on groundwater, as that first number there says. And, um, you know, it can be as high as $20,000 a hectare. So that's obviously an investment that you need to see a return on. And um, we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, we have basically three major possibilities with respect to grant, to access to water and we have examples of all of these across the Kimberley. So um, shallow groundwater as I mentioned before is really about um, trying to find the highest flow and the uh, the least depth so that you can reduce your energy costs but that's a, um, a groundwater supply that requires pressurisation and lift. Um, in the Northern Pilbara there's two properties, Malal and Pardu, that um, sit above an artesian system, and that's quite a fascinating system in that, um, you know, it's a very expensive upfront cost. Um, a bore there could typically cost uh, anywhere between three hundred and four hundred thousand um, dollars. However, you get a very high flow, and you get it at pressure. So some of the flows can be, you know, around three hundred liters a second, and they're at thirty psi, which enables them to run. Um, somewhere between two or three centre pivots off one bore without any pumping. And so that upfront investment gets paid off over time through um, uh, lower energy costs. Uh, so you see the total capital costs there creep up a bit and head more towards 15000 to 20000 but in the long run um, it tends to break even uh, compared to the shallow groundwater after about eight years. Um, we do also have some other uh, properties in um, some of the river catchments that are looking at surface water capture and that's quite a different um, uh, way to, to manage water and the subject of much debate at the moment with um, in the Fitzroy Valley um, but that would be for either surface irrigation or or being captured and um, through a ring tank or something and pumped up into a pivot um, and we see an example of that at Liveringa Station. Uh, currently, where they capture um, uh, water through a creek or through the off one of the river tributaries, and um, they have a license to to pump that out through the centre pivot, uh, depending on how much earthworks are involved and um, the location. Obviously, costs can vary a lot. Um, we also have um, because of our environment, it's quite logical to to look at drip tape, um, and we have a really innovative experiment. Um, there at Anna Plains where um, David Stowe has, has invested in some drip irrigation looking at rose grass. Now um, the capital costs that I've quoted here are really for you know something like um, grapes or asparagus um, 
but the investment into drip tape is a little bit higher than the than the pivots, but um, the advantage being that you can handle extreme weather events and obviously uh, water efficiency. And uh, David's doing a fantastic job of of working that system out. It, it, uh, with a lot of experimentation, I might add, but he's uh, uh, certainly um, breaking the mould there in terms of um, looking at drip irrigation and its application to fodder production. Um, as I said before, in terms of what people are doing, there's a real mix, um, but you could break it down into three basic groups. There's the, the hay producers that are either producing hay for their own consumption or they're um, uh, creating a, a sort of a haylage, so it would be a wrapped hay product. Uh, or there are some who are looking at true silage, so like a silage pit. You can see an example of that in the right hand corner photo there at Liveringa. Um, and there's others who are just saying, well, can we just graze this as a graze pasture, as we would see in, in other southern temperate systems? And they all come with their own unique challenges. Um, I'll work through each of these scenarios just as we uh, progress through the talk. In terms of some of the crop options and rotations, this is very simplified, but um, in essence there's there's um, two basic choices. You either set up a perennial system, which will be a, a tropical grass, uh, and out of the tropical grasses that perform best in both our wet and dry season, um, it's most likely going to be a Rhodes variety or a panic, green panic. Um, these systems produce the highest bulk yield of any of the options. However, not necessarily the highest quality. So you, you, you trade quality for yield. And um, the highest period of growth is when it's warm and raining and, and uh, humid, and that's obviously in our wet season. And then depending on where you are, uh, whether you're inland or coastal or further north or further south, um, your growth in the dry season will really be dictated by um, uh, by nighttime temperature. So as the nighttime temperatures reduce, um, we see lower growth. And um, but of the tropical grasses, these particular um, species are the ones that will continue to produce in the dry season. You get others um, like buffalo grass, for example, that that probably would produce very little biomass in the dry season at all. Um, there's been a lot of uh, work done on mixed passes. Can we have a mix, you know, can we introduce a legume to the mix to um, uh, to try to improve the quality of these grasses? And um, in essence, they're just too competitive and or they get grazed out if the system's being grazed. So a mixed pasture is actually quite a difficult thing to maintain. Um, and in terms of tropical grass quality, uh, in a later slide, I'll just talk about some of the strategies in, in how to maximise quality by uh, changing your cutting regime. Um, the other option is to have a an annual rotation and you really need both a dry season and a wet season option. Um, it's really not a practical thing to do to come in and out of perennial and annual options. So once you've established a perennial grass, you know, it's quite capable of uh, continuing to perform for, for many years and um, killing that, re resetting the paddock and sowing again loses a lot of time. So the kind of dry season options that people are looking at now are um, cut and carry or silage. So, you know, can we produce a really high quality fresh chop? through maize or sweet sorghum. Um, a lot of people have tried the temperate crops, things like oats and lucerne, um, and they have variable performance. So they have a much higher quality um, uh, biomass because of their, you know, being C3 plants, they tend to produce a lot more sugars than the, the C4 plants. Um, however, they really uh, don't have a long enough window in our dry season to uh, perform well. So we have had some good results in trials with oats. Uh, however, in a paddock situation, that tends to be more limited, and people are really questioning the you know the broader viability of these crops. Um, we also had quite a bit of interest in alternative fodders and sugar beets and things like that. Um, so far, we haven't really seen promising results in the trials that we've conducted. Um, in the wet season, 
the options are a bit more limited. So really you need um, either a sorghum or a millet. Um, it's a little bit warm for maize uh, and and or a tropical legume like cavalcade, cowpea, um, blue pea, those types of um, uh, South American legumes. In terms of the hay market, so people really either want to, as I said before, um, uh, produce hay for sale or they don't want to buy any more hay and just produce hay for themselves. Um, this is, the actual economics of hay are, are very unique for everybody, but um, really it's, it's about freight and depends where you are and where your customers are or where your source is. So. Um, Ten years ago, you would have had to buy hay either from Kununurra or from Perth, and um, uh, there was one property, Kilto, which was producing hay for sale sometimes, but it wasn't a regular supply. So, um, so really, because of the climate, we really to produce quality hay all year round, we have to have irrigation. Um, even if we had enough rainfall, we're still constrained by pastoral policy in terms of the uh, production of dryland pastures. And irrigation production is really constrained by both land availability, risk, um, complexity and economics. So we don't have a quality uh, system for hay. Uh, really quality is very much driven by word of mouth. And if you're in the game of selling hay, um, that is really, really important. Um, it's really all about, all about quality. Um, to give you a rough idea, uh, to get the kind of yields that uh, and prices that require a break-even point, it really needs to be $250 a tonne or more and 30 tonnes per hectare per year or more. And certainly our um, perennial grasses are capable of that. Um, forage sorghums are capable of that but most of our temperate crop options uh, wouldn't reach that yield, they'd certainly reach that price. But um, um, So in this particular case, this, um, this break-even analysis here was done making some assumptions of 120 hectares of irrigated rose grass using shallow groundwater and just based on variable crops. So it's not trying to um, pay off the entire investment. To do that, you can see there I've got a figure there, break even at uh, $1,600 or $2,600 a year. That's based on some figures that Andrew Ash uh, produced out of CSIRO. Um, I'd suggest that to pay off the investment, you really need an income much closer to um, uh, $3,500 a year. So if we look at our break even analysis here, as I said, it's $250 a tonne or more. and um, a minimum of 31 tonnes per hectare per year of production as a consistent yield. The people who do that do it really well and they use a lot of these techniques to do that uh, and in fact exceed that. Um, so it's often been said and, and quite fairly that you know uh, irrigation doesn't pay in tropical environments and certainly where you have the ability to uh, have a high rainfall and uh, the freedom to grow uh, a wide range of plants um, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to get into irrigation um, however we're in a different situation and so the people who have uh, really um, grown a lot of hay and, and done it well. They have very short cutting cycles um, to maximise quality. Um, using techniques to preserve hay in, in humid and hot environments um, and predominantly reducing mould or maximising quality and reducing the risk of fire. And that's done through very careful irrigation and nutrient monitoring. So that's one of the things that I support people with is um, helping them to interpret um, uh, soil moisture status and how do you uh, make sure you minimise the stress on the plants. And so our C4 grasses can handle stress very well, but what they do is they throw out uh, stem and seed, which reduces your quality. So it's not a case of the plant uh, being stressed and dying, it's just a case of your quality dropping. 
and you can see here's an example of the soil moisture probes. In this case, it's the Centec probe. Um, and by following the little squiggles on the graph here, basically whenever the line goes up, there's been an irrigation applied. And whenever you see the line graduate down, uh, that would have been when they've cut for hay. So um, you can see here's the commencement. If you can see my cursor on the screen here, there's the commencement of an irrigation cycle or a hay cutting cycle multiple irrigations and then a cut and dry down and then watering up again and it's really about um, this particular part of the graph is looking at individual depths of soil moisture so um, 10 centimeters 20 centimeters 40 80 and 1.5 meters and the aim being to control moisture in the surface and stabilize moisture at depth which shows that you're you're not um, pushing water beyond the root zone you can see where the root zone is active and that we're stabilizing moisture over the duration of the cutting cycle and this technology is really helpful to uh, to do that and also demonstrate responsible water use um, to regulators in the community using uh, satellite technology and in this case irisat um, you can look at the growth or a, a typical rose grass hay crop and the cycles over the year. So you can see uh, here in the wet season, the growth is much uh, more erratic. So it's, um, it, it grows very quickly. Um, and in the dry season, you sort of settle down into this steady pattern um, where the cutting cycles extend a little bit due to the cool weather. And then they start to speed up again once it gets hotter. And this uh, Irisat technology is a very handy way uh, for me to um, assist people when they're a long way away from me because I can get a weekly update and, and um, see what's going on. So that's a, a typical sort of hay, hay crop cycle. Um, when we talk about stand and graze, um, probably the, the two major investors into this are uh, uh, Wallal and Pardee. So what we mean by stand and graze is virtually a, a, you know, trying to emulate a, a dairy style system where you, 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 the cattle are directly grazing the pasture. And um, both of these stations invested in stand and graze at different times. Uh, Wallal station um, was really, they had, a, had other properties and they, uh, actually had quite good native pastures, but they wanted to be able to hold cattle. Um, they didn't want to avoid poor sales and manage poor seasons, and they wanted to, to develop heavier cattle. Uh, Padu, on the other hand, um, was much more of a um, aspirational and trans transformational project where they really wanted to establish two herds. Uh, I think initially they were looking at phasing out the, the um, the sort of more normal uh, Brahmin sort of short, hand, short horn herd that they had, but um, they're probably likely to end up with two herds, with one uh, uh, more typical of other stations and one as a, a purebred Wagyu herd. And uh, the owner of Pardew Station, Bruce Strong, has um, access to supply chains that um, are quite unique through Singapore and China and, and um, really was looking to capitalise on that through his investment here in Australia. Um, another big question for Stand and Graze is really what is the best use of, of that pasture? Is it actually to just you know, put on sheer weight or is uh, fecundity actually a better option? And um, again, Syro did some analysis through that uh, um, through the most recent uh, NARA reports. Um, and certainly for a lot of people, um, focusing on uh, fertility might be a better way to go. Um, but what's driven the thinking behind this, this is actually quite an old graph, but it, it just demonstrates um, why pastoralists would invest or seek to have access to a better food stock because of our natural conditions. So this blue line here is a typical um, pastoral situation where you lose weight, gain weight, lose weight, gain weight over a period of time and end up with a fairly low sale weight. Uh, this red line here represents the uh, the weight limit at the time for Indonesia. 
compared to if those cattle were uh, sold on and um, then moved down south, then they would have a loss and a dip, but then they would be put on a better pasture or a better planning nutrition and come up to Sarwait. Australists back here would miss out on that gain. Uh, and similarly, if um, if the same beast was um, basically put onto an improved pasture from day one, uh, there's very little dips there and they reach the same sale weight uh, of 600 kilos much more quickly. So clearly our pastoralists were saying, how can we get a piece of that action? How can we make that happen? When we look at some of the challenges that we face in terms of doing that in our environment, um, we do have a challenge with quality. And so we can grow quantity quite well, um, but given the restrictions on the crops, um, both from a, from a climatic point of view and a policy point of view, we uh, uh, find it very difficult to find a range of crops that can actually produce uh, a high level of uh, metabolizable energy. So in this example here, if we had uh, different groups of cattle, and this was put together by one of my colleagues, Jeff Moore, um, based on MLA data. Um, cattle at different live weights will gain weight at different speeds, um, but you don't need a very big increase in quantity to get a very big increase in uh, weight gain. So if we look at the 400 kilo beast that's eating half a kilo, uh, sorry, eating eight kilos a day, and putting on half a kilo a day, but their metabolizable energy is nine. Uh, if that is boosted to, sorry, that box is sorry, uh, to 11, uh, they only need to eat another two, two kilos a day and they can um, put on much more weight. So physiologically, we have a, a, a bit of an energy barrier there that we need to overcome. Just bear with me, my slides has stopped moving. Uh, the reason for this is um, some of the composition of the C4 grasses and the, the ratio between stem and leaf and then the quality of that stem and leaf over time. So uh, my colleagues Jeff and Clinton did this research, uh, so full credit to them for this one. They are just demonstrating that if you had a Rhodes grass crop and uh, you're in week one, that the quality of the stem and the leaf is actually, um, the stem is predominantly always going to be below uh, 8 megajoules a kilogram of, of energy. Um, however, the leaf can certainly get up there around 10, which uh, if we remember from our slide before is, is highly desirable. However, it doesn't stay there long. So after the second and third week, that quality drops and um, however the yield or the quantity increases. So it doesn't make sense to, to cut the leaf in week one because it's, um, there's clearly not enough yield there to do that. By the time you get to week two or three, you're trading yield for quality. And that's basically a management decision that um, operators need to make. If you let it go to four, five or six weeks, um, then you're, you're really trading off uh, you're probably not getting a great deal more yield and you're, and you're certainly trading off quality. Um, if we combine that, um, so just to reinforce the point I made before, our target up here is to sort of reach this theoretical uh, weight gain for a 400 kilo beast of 1.25 kilos per, per day of weight gain. Um, we fall short and irrespective of whether that is the amount of cattle that you can stock at the set uh, energy rate or uh, that you have enough food for mold for that stocking rate, but you're going to have a lower quality. So this um, is what I call the, the energy gap and uh, is really the subject of uh, much thinking at the moment, both private and public. Um, this is some, some notes from uh, Mick Courtney, who's the uh, stock manager for Part of Beef. And um, this is some of his observations around standard grades and just how um, 
uh, complex some of this this direct grazing can be. But certainly um, matching that pasture growth with consumption and then cattle numbers is a very challenging thing for, for all involved. Um, trying to forecast the rotation. So here we have a picture of Moengem. Uh This is one cell within the pivot. You can see on the right hand side here, um, there's a lot of uh, stem and flower in that particular cell. And I'd suggest that that's at least four weeks or more um, since it's been cut. So it's losing quality. Over here, you've got probably a higher quality, but much lower yield. And it's just balancing those trade-offs uh, in terms of grazing decisions is a very um, uh, tricky business. Um, and then also dealing with the seasonal fluctuations between wet and dry. Um, one of the other challenges that he noted is the is predictive animal behaviour. So the animal, you know, they will actually stop eating and they wait to go to the next cell. Um, and one of the suggestions we had around that was to actually uh, not use the same gate, so have two gates into the cell and alternate them so that they never you keep them guessing. Um, Kevin, Professor Kevin Bell, who also works with Party Beef and Mick, is uh, you know he's really um, working with MLA to look at this in some detail. But in essence, it would be nice if I was to any you know, the cattlemen listening that um, cattle are selective. And um, I guess when people were first trying to manage these systems, they said, oh, we'll force the cattle to stay there, we'll force them to eat that. Um, but you're going to lose weight, undoubtedly. So um, it's really mechanical intervention is one of the ways in which we can manage that. We have to come back in and reset the pasture and do that through a slashing or, or a bale. Um, so balancing those decisions again, uh, in this case here's Kevin uh, with some of the guys from Wallow Station who are sitting there talking about, you know, how do we make those judgments? How do we work out when to do that? How do we work out when to um, uh, make the most efficient use of our labour and resources, and particularly um, fertiliser inputs. And so another developing uh, management tool is really balancing the, the fertiliser inputs. And one of the great things about these grasses is, you know, if, if your cattle numbers are down for some reason, you can actually back off and um, they'll be perfectly fine. In fact, we had a, a situation at Mullingen where the, the bore broke down and the the um, rose grass wasn't watered for some 37 days and after a couple of waters you, you'd never tell the difference. Um, so the pasture growth cycle by comparison to the hay cycle is much more constant even though it's being grazed and even though it's um, um, you know being slashed and it, in terms of water use and growth it's actually much more consistent so this is again using the Eurosat technology, but it's looking at a pasture crop. And you can see that there's some seasonal fluctuations. Um, this white spike coming down from the graph here is actually cloud blocking the satellite. So uh, it was probably quite cloudy and cool here, and hence a drop in growth. Um, but over the dry season, it's really quite consistent. And then this dip in the graph here is due to the breakdown that I just talked about there before. So this is, this is Mullingen. Um, consequently, the irrigation decisions that go with that are much more consistent. So instead of that uh, very cyclical irrigation with small irrigations, as we looked at uh, some slides ago, it's a much sort of deeper irrigation, a deeper root system, um, much more consistent growth. And so for an irrigation manager, it's actually a lot easier. So you're putting on, you know, roughly 20 millimetres every irrigation every few days according to the weather and trying to keep it as consistent as possible. One of the big things with um, grazing directly is um, where to put your infrastructure. And there's multiple examples of this across the Kimberley, both good and bad. Uh, this particular one is Moengem, where there's a, quite a large area in the middle of the pivot that was fenced off to allow movement in and out. Um, but in essence, you lose quite a lot of area there. And then you also lose area around that infrastructure because we kind of walk around it. So the thinking here has changed somewhat in terms of potentially having water points off the pivot, um, perhaps not needing these large fenced off areas in the centre of the pivot. Maybe you just need a very small one here and a series of gates. Um, and there's a lot of debate across the industry about you know, what is the best 
um, thing. There's also some um, animal health and welfare considerations around that because we don't want cattle congregating in one spot consistently because they will um, uh, there is an increased risk of disease. Um, and I guess the last word on this from Mick was really around um, you know irrigation. Uh, has its own issues and if something goes wrong uh, that could be something like locusts have come in and, and decimated pastures or it could be a, a, a machinery breakdown that you need a bit of a backup plan um, in terms of uh, and some food storage. Um, in terms of the economics of stand and graze uh, this work was done by GOV Agriculture as part of a, a Royal East Regions project here called Water for Food and um, Water for Food funded the Moenjum trial, which allowed um, some in-depth sort of economics on, on uh, stand and graze. And typically these crops, whether they're hay or pasture, would, would use around 15 megalitres, uh, sorry, 15 megalitres per hectare of water per year. Um, fairly high fertiliser inputs, we're, we're dealing with sandy soils. Um, and the operational costs, obviously, including the labour of moving cattle around. Um, they achieved a live weight gain of, of um, around 3,702 kilograms a hectare a year. So quite an impressive live weight gain there. And estimated that their break-even cost for live weight gain was a, was a cattle price of $1.91. Um, now, again, these costs are different for everyone. I think the broader industry would say that um, Perhaps it's aspirational. The, the trial, however, gave these results. Just to sort of close out and summarise, um, I think, as I've mentioned, the, um, the unique situations really do change the economics. So we, it's not um, possible to compare. Uh, you le certainly learn off other clients, but you can have two clients next door to each other that have quite a different reason for investing in irrigation. It's not a one size fits all. My advice to all of them is to cost out all the other options first. So what are the other things you can do with the herd that you have and the station that you have before you get into irrigation because it really is quite a big leap in terms of management and that the success of that is really all about management. Um, you do, particularly if you're not familiar with Western Australia, we've, uh, we, you know, we've had a, a lot of uh, foreign investors and others that have bought stations here and um, struggled with some of the settings, policy settings in WA and some of the uh, approval time frames and complexity that are involved. And not all of those are in government's hands. You know, there's um, native title issues to consider, there's uh, Aboriginal heritage, there's uh, a raft of, you know, community support that really needs or a social licence that really needs to be earned. Um, Pre-feasibility is an area that, that we help people with. Um, but you can put it all on the spreadsheet, but it's really all about management. Uh, management makes the success of a project and having managers that are empowered, it's a good information to, to make the right decision at the right time. Uh, staff skills and retention is a, is a real issue for us here. Um, you know, young people don't tend to stay in the Kimberley too long. Uh, there are some exceptions, but um, you know, there's a lot of traveling workers. And similarly, our service industries, um, all want to be here and they want to, want to help, um, but they have to deal with higher costs and uh, isolation as well. So to answer my question, why would you invest in irrigation? Um, look, it's it's not for everyone uh, and there's certainly no romance involved. Um, as Jim Trambus at Chelemar said, he, he said he takes people to his property and people are saying it's so beautiful watching the sunset over the pivot. He said, I don't see any of that, I just see financial risk. And um, and he's one of our uh, best growers. So it really is a slow, steady grind. Very high management inputs. It's not the sort of thing you can do on a weekend and head off mustering on the other side of the station. If you do it well, there are good returns. And I think it's a very promising opportunity for, for the Kimberley and Kilburn.